In this episode of Data Framed, a Data Camp podcast, I'll be speaking with Randy Olson, lead data scientist at Life Epigenetics. Randy specializes in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data visualization, is an open science advocate, and created Teapot, a data science assistant and a Python automated machine learning tool that optimizes machine learning pipelines using genetic programming. We'll be talking about automated machine learning, the verticals it could impact, and how it will change a large portion of what data scientists do every day, along with how they approach the questions they ask and communication with relevant stakeholders. If you're a data scientist wondering how automated machine learning will impact your career, stick around. If you work in a vertical that uses data science to get from data to insight, there'll also be a great deal in here to interest you. Don't be shy. I'm Hugo Bowne Anderson, a data scientist at Data Camp, and this is Data Framed. Welcome to Data Framed, a weekly Data Camp podcast exploring what data science looks like on the ground for working data scientists and what problems it can solve. I'm your host, Hugo Bowne Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Hugo Bowne and Data Camp at Data Camp. You can find all our episodes and show notes at datacamp.com slash community slash podcast. Hi, Randy, and welcome to Data Framed. Hey, thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm super excited to be talking about automated machine learning with you today and the type of impact we're, we see on the ground and, and will in the future. But before we get to that, I'd like to know a bit about you. What are you known for in the data science community? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm known for a, a few things in the data science community. I, I, I guess one, having a huge Twitter account with way uh, that follows way too many other accounts. But I, but I think early on, I was known for like data visualization. And during grad school, I ran a data visualization blog. Um, and so, some posts from that became way more popular than I ever expected, like the optimized road trips and everything. And I realized like, oh no, I'm actually not becoming known for like the data science, as the data science guy or the machine learning guy or the AI guy. I was becoming like the optimized road trip guy. Um, and that, that was not quite where I was wanting to go with my career. So uh, I started focusing my blog and, and other efforts more on like, you know, pointing out all the open source tool development and the tutorials that I do. Um, and most recently focusing on pushing this field called automated machine learning, which I'm really excited to talk with you about today. As am I. And something about your blog that I always found really inspiring is it, you wouldn't only dedicate yourself to particular topics. You'd actually show how data science techniques, methodologies, and the types of ways we ask questions can be applied to nearly anything, right? Right. Yeah, that was that was part of my goal. Was um, I mean, for for me, my blog was actually a learning experience. You know, so I was sort of learning these techniques and applying them as I went. Um, so you know, jumping from various topics as you know something interesting came up that was important to me, but also just trying different approaches, whether it was data visualization approaches, analysis approaches, machine learning approaches. That was also very important, and hopefully, it turned out to be a, a valuable resource for the data science community as well. Yeah, it definitely has been. And we'll include a link to it in the show notes also. So what do you spend most of your professional time doing these days? Um, so, well, so up until about January of 2018, I was at the University of Pennsylvania. And so I was in a very fortunate position there in a very good lab where I got to spend most of my time developing and evaluating uh, new machine learning methods and applying them to uh, biomedical problems that we had there at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, but actually in January, I, I made the jump out of academia and into industry and joined a startup company called Life Epigenetics. And so now most of the time, I, I spend my time working with epigenetics data and you know cleaning it, analyzing it, visualizing it, and most importantly, modeling it. So to, to try to predict um, you know various outcomes that are interesting and useful for the life insurance industry. Well, firstly, congratulations on the new position. Thanks. It's a very exciting move. <laughs> Absolutely. And secondly, could you just uh, give us uh, the elevator pitch on what epigenetics is? Uh, yeah. Okay. So so the chief science officer, hopefully he doesn't listen to this and get mad at me because I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Uh, I remember I'm a computer science guy. <laughs> yeah. So we have this basic idea of, of genetics, right? A genetic code that we all have that is translated in some way to express and basically become what we are, right? Uh, epigenetics is a layer on top of that. You can think of it sort of like an interpreter of your genetics. 
And so there are various things that can affect your genetics and how they interpret your DNA. Um, and so we're looking at how certain lifestyle habits like smoking and drinking affect your epigenetics and whether we can basically look at your epigenetic profile uh, and see, you know, are you a smoker, are you a drinker, so on and so forth. That's the elevator pitch, I'd say. Fantastic. So we're here today to talk about automated machine learning. But first, I'd, I'd like to explore a bit about what machine learning is and and the places where, where you find it really, really interesting. Can you give me a brief rundown of what machine learning is to you? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Very brief, very high level, at least, because otherwise we can spend the whole a whole hour just talking about that. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I think if you look in most, you know, machine learning books or uh, the Wikipedia or anywhere else, uh, most places will say that at a high level, machine learning aims to give computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So that's a quote that we'll see around a lot. And nowadays, I think most machine learning focuses on what's called supervised learning where basically this idea is that we can provide data to the computer that we sometimes call features that are sampled from some system. You know, the, the most common example is like the iris flower classification example where you take measurements of the flowers. And then you want to provide corresponding labels for that data. So maybe you'll take some measurements from a flower and say, okay, this is this kind of species. Once you provide enough of those samples, maybe dozens, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of those, you feed that information to a machine learning algorithm, and it's basically going to try to learn some mapping between those features and those labels. And hopefully a good machine learning algorithm will learn a good mapping that will also work well on unseen samples. So if you go and measure new flowers out in the wild and you give those features to the machine learning algorithm, it can accurately classify them in that way. Great, so in that sense, it, it generalizes to other data in, in the world. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's trying to learn general patterns about that system that you're measuring the features from. That was a really cool explanation of, of machine learning. And I think the Iris data set is great for pedagogical values, although I feel like I've seen it too many times in my in my lifetime. But I, I know there are a lot of applications that you're really interested in of machine learning powers. So maybe you could tell us a bit about those. Yeah, sure. Well, so one, I'll say, yeah, I, the Iris data set is definitely way, way overused. I've been trying to branch out myself. Um, and I, I actually encourage anyone in machine learning who's, who's making tutorials to do the same. Um, but, but yeah, in terms of interesting applications that I've seen now, you know, I, I would say two that are really interesting to me are, uh, well, one is personalized healthcare. Um, you know, I think it's really interesting that at least in the hospital systems, we're working on collecting information about people's health histories and their treatments and so on and so forth uh, and getting, getting that into a useful format. And so now we can start ans answering questions or at least asking questions like based on my personal health history, what am I at risk for? Or more importantly, what interventions can I make to prevent you know, some disease or some adverse outcome that may happen to me in the future? And of course, it's important to point out that we have a long way to go, but there have also, if you watch the tech news, at least there have been a lot of small wins along the way. Another really, really interesting application to me is taking that idea and bringing it into insurance pricing. So now can we, can, can we make predictions about people's risk factors, you know, how likely they are to develop cancer or, or some other disease and, and factor that into insurance pricing. So I, I never found, thought that I would be going into a, an insurance pricing industry, but it turned out to be very much the same as my last job working in these biomedical applications. So it was a very surprising uh, discovery for me. And are these the type of questions you, th you think about it and work on at Life Epigenetics? Uh, well, so right now we're mostly focused on modeling the epigenetics data. But as we expand as a team and as a company, we're definitely going to be expanding our horizons in terms of, you know, looking at full medical records and how are those predictive of people's longevity and various other things that are of interest to the life insurance industry. Um, so these are definitely things we're keeping in mind, even if we're not necessarily focusing on it. And, but you, you do use m machine learning in your work at Life Epigenetics. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just, just before we hopped on uh, to do this interview, I was playing around with, with Keras. Well, I shouldn't say playing around. I was doing serious work with Keras <laughs> and building some deep neural network models uh, of, of the data that we're working with now. Fantastic. And are there any other interesting applications that you like at the moment? 
Yeah. So, so aside from what, what I would say, the, the obvious ones to me, which are the ones that have actually drawn me to, you know, drawn me in my career. Another really, really interesting one that I've seen coming out of the deep learning research is being able to impersonate celebrities in video. Um, and this is, I remember when I, I saw the first one, they were doing, they did uh, some videos with, uh, with Donald Trump. So basically taking a video of him during an interview, and then they're having him say all kinds of silly and weird things. Um, and it was, it was really funny, you know, especially if you're in the, the right group of friends. But if you think about it, there's a lot of potentially malicious applications of that kind of technology, right? You can imagine if the, the people who had made that video of Donald Trump had more malicious political intentions and they wanted to force him to say something that looked bad on the U S or anything else, which, you know, Donald Trump doesn't need much help doing that. But <laughs> I was about you to can say imagine, that. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine that, you know, they can have him say certain things that may alienate even more people or anything else um, or any other politicians, right? You can do, you can imagine they can do the same thing for, for any other public figures trying to discredit them by saying something that goes against who they really are. Right. And I think one of the most disturbing applications that I've, that I've seen and, and, and it seems to be getting shut down, but not completely because it's the Internet is like non consensual pornography. So it's now possible to, you know, make it look like some actor or actress is involved in a pornography film when they had no idea about it. Right. They did not give their consent. They did not want to be involved in that whatsoever. But because we have this technology now. It's entirely possible, right? So there's all kinds of malicious applications of this technology. It's really interesting, but it's also something that I think we really need to sit down and think about in terms of should we really, you know, what, what should we do about this new machine learning technology that we've developed? Yeah, I, I think it's a very concerning and a conversation we need to keep having. I'm wondering if, if machine learning could be used to detect these types of malicious applications as well. I would say yes. I hope so. <laughs> Probably. I would say anything is possible when you have good enough data and good enough labels. Yeah. Okay, great. So we've seen what machine learning is. We've seen a bunch of interesting applications. Let's talk about machine learning automation. What What does that mean? Yeah, sure. So so basically, if we go back to that quote that I gave when I was describing machine learning, you know, where the idea of machine learning is to say that we want to give the, com the computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. If anyone ever said that to me, I would call them out and, and say that they're they're just telling me BS right now because I have used machine learning a lot in my career at this point, and I know that there is a ton of manual programming when it comes to machine learning. I mean, if you look at just a standard machine learning workflow, it's not just like you know you take a machine learning algorithm, give it data, and magic happens. No, you actually have to pre-process and clean the data first. You have to reshape the data so it's in a good format to actually apply machine learning algorithms to. You have to choose the right machine learning algorithm for the problem. And that's not as simple as just choosing uh, your favorite one. There is no such thing as a best machine learning algorithm for all problems. Um, and then you also have to tune not only the machine learning algorithm, but you have to tune all the pre-processing pre -processing steps that came before that, right? So tune their parameters, so on and so forth. And so usually this is a highly iterative process where you start with, you know, some basic analysis and you try it, you maybe try to fit some machine learning algorithm on it. Doesn't work well. So you go back to the drawing board, you try a different algorithm, you try different parameters, what have you. And, and you easily spend, you know, hours, days, maybe even weeks just stuck in this loop depending on how knowledgeable you are about that process and how large the data set is that you're working with. Absolutely. And I, I occasionally joke that it's, there's as much an art to it as there is a science, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's, you can, there can be a huge time savings by just having, you know, experience, you know, personalized experience with uh, the domain that you're applying the machine learning algorithms to uh, and also the algorithms that you're using. Right. So maybe a beginner, would, it would basically be a random search, uh, whereas an expert knows, you know, where to jump depending on the problem. Now, I should also point out, by the way, that, you know, it's the same issue in deep learning, right, where when you start with a, let's say, classification problem that you want to use deep learning for, you have to decide on an architecture, you have to decide on the activation functions, you have to decide on so many different things about that neural network that, you know, it's, it's also a huge iterative process that's really pretty much a black art. So these are things that we could potentially automate. 
Yeah. So when I looked at this, this whole iterative process here, you know, I, I said to myself, there's no way we can't automate the majority of this, of this process. And it turns out, you know, when I had started my, so this was a conclusion I came to at the start of my post talk back in 2014. Uh, and it turns out I wasn't the only person who had that idea. So there's this whole field called automated machine learning, where the idea is that we want to automate this whole process of not only tuning the parameters of a machine learning algorithm, but choosing the best machine learning algorithm for the problem, or even best combination of machine learning algorithms, choosing the best pre-processing steps, so on and so forth. And so in terms of what we can automate at the moment, what's the lowest hanging fruit for automation? Well, right, right now, I'd say that the lowest hanging fruit for automated machine learning is basically anything where you can make a change or tune the machine learning pipeline, where, where a machine learning pipeline is basically the steps from, you know, reading in and pre-processing the data all the way to uh, actually fitting the machine learning algorithm. We can make any change to that pipeline and then measure some sort of goodness of that solution, right? So that can be some loss function. Or, or anything else, you know, anything that you can compute and measure. Um, so right now, most of the focus in automated machine learning is on supervised learning, of course, right? Because you can fit a machine learning algorithm, calculate its, its uh, let's say, five-fold or ten-fold cross-validation accuracy, and use that as sort of a measuring stick of, oh, did, you know, did this change I make, was that a good change or a bad change? And so that, that's definitely one of the major focuses right now. Uh, another one that's that's come to fruition in the past year or so has been uh, deep neural network architecture search. So, you know, I briefly mentioned before that the, deep, the whole deep learning artificial neural network uh, architecture design process is very similar to uh, tuning a machine learning pipeline. So you can apply the same pro the same sort of optimization process here to help you. Uh, figure out the architecture of your artificial neural network. That's really interesting because there are, we do know that certain architectures are better at certain domain challenges, right? Like you'd use something different for image classification than you would for text classification. Exactly. These are the things that are the lowest hanging fruit. What do you see being the most difficult to automate with respect to machine learning? Yeah, so so basically auto automated machine learning will be able to automate the easier aspects of machine learning, right? You know, choosing the pre-processing algorithms, choosing machine learning algorithms, tuning the parameters. Uh, and, and that's what's great about that is that it's going to allow humans to focus on the more difficult aspects of machine learning and data science. So there, there's, there's two aspects that come to mind for me right now, one being technical. So in a sense of working with messy, really heterogeneous data, maybe data that comes from the web, for example, um, that can be very, very difficult to work with in an automated fashion that usually requires someone to sit down and, and parse out this unstructured data and figure out how to structure it properly. Uh, on the other end, there's also uh, a creative challenge that, that is difficult to automate. And that's really th more thinking like a data scientist um, in the sense of, you know, looking at a business problem or even an academic problem and, and asking, how do I translate this problem from a business problem into a data problem, right? So what data should I collect to tackle this problem? How should I collect that data? How should I label that data? So on and so forth. Those are, those are things that are still very well within the human domain rather than the automated machine learning domain. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this also speaks to the fact that automated machine learning doesn't mean automated data science, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think that we should be looking at automated machine learning and automated machine learning tools as more like data science assistants rather than replacements for data scientists, for sure. Right. And your project, Teapot, is actually called a, a data science assistant, right? Yeah, exactly. So there's... there's uh, <laughs> yeah, there's no, no coincidence there. <laughs> That's definitely been part of the branding of that project. We'll jump right back into our interview with Randy Olson after a short segment. Let's now jump into a segment called Data Science Best Practices with Spencer Boucher. What are we talking about today, Spence? Today, I thought it would be a good idea to talk a bit about data sets and where they come from. When you're playing around with a new data science technique or teaching one to somebody else, you're always going to need some data. So today's data science best practice is to broaden the collection of data sets and data sources that you're familiar with. So I, for one, am a little bit sick of classifying iris flowers every single time I learn a new classification algorithm. 
the iris data set is just so pervasive because it has this great strength of being included in a base installation of R. But we can and we definitely should be spicing things up as much as we can. What built-in data set are you personally sick of, Hugo? Well, let me think. I've definitely analyzed and visualized the MT Cars data set enough times now that I would definitely not say no to having something new. Yes, that is another data horse that I think it's safe to say we've beaten to death a little bit as a community. Other data sets, like the MNIST data set for classifying handwritten digits, have also become very popular in recent years. And while MNIST is a much larger example that isn't just a toy data set, I think we can still do better. So where can we go to find cool data to play with, Spence? Well, this is the good news. Open data has just completely exploded in the past 10 years, so there's no shortage these days. One of my favorites is the UCI Machine Learning Repository, which has been around for just ages, at least in machine learning years. And it's currently up to, I think, 427 data sets curated to be especially interesting for machine learning problems. Each data set is even tagged with the number of features, the number of observations, types of features, and even which type of machine learning problem that data set is ideally suited for. So if, for example, you want to play around with a new classification algorithm you just learned that only works for categorical data, you can quickly find a data set that fits that set of conditions just right. Great. And also, 538, for example, publishes the data behind most of their analyses right on their website. This is a great and reliable source, especially when you're interested in hot-button political topics or sports data. Yes, and if it's government data you're after, you can go straight to the source at data.gov. I personally recommend poking around the Federal Reserve economic data. That's got historical data for everything from unemployment rates to interest rates to GDP and much more. Plus, just a couple of weeks ago, Rafael Irizarry, a professor of applied statistics at Harvard, released a new R package called DS Labs, which contains data sets that he found pedagogically useful in data science courses that he's taught over the years. One of my favorites in that package is actually a data set from the popular blog Spurious Correlations. So the whole point of the Spurious Correlations blog is to demonstrate how easy it is for things to be correlated, even when there's clearly no causal relationship, by scanning a huge amount of historical data and cherry-picking relationships. So that one is really great and fun for teaching about correlation and causation. Awesome. So also Reddit actually has a data set subreddit that features a lot of bizarre up to the moment topical stuff. All of Trump's tweets are there, for example. New repositories of data like the others we've mentioned will also bubble to the top in this subreddit as they get launched. Yes. And here's another really good one. Kaggle now lets users submit data sets for other people to upvote as well, all the way up to 20 gigabytes. Some really cool, wacky, off-the-wall stuff winds up there. Everything from Kickstarter projects data to the brainwave data of confused students from EEG is on the front page, even as we speak right now. Thanks, Spence. We really only scratched the surface here. Next time you find yourself loading the MT Cars data set, spice up your life a little instead and go find something new. Spencer, I'm also glad that you mentioned Kaggle's open data platform. Next week, I'll be speaking with Anthony Goldblum, the CEO of Kaggle, about their open data platform. Kaggle kernels, the future of data science, and much more. Kaggle is now more than a platform for machine learning competitions, so make sure to tune in. After that interlude, it's time to jump back into our chat with Randy. So maybe you can tell us about the main tools that that, that exist in, in the automated machine learning space. Yeah, sure. So I'll focus more on, on the tools that, that do more than just hyperparameter tuning. You know, there's there's a lot of tools out there, even, even you know, really popular packages like Scikit-Learn have the ability to do hyperparameter tuning through grid search and random search and, and other means. So, you know, I would say that, you know, the, the top projects in terms of the free and open source space are, are going to be uh, Auto SK Learn and Auto Weka. So Auto SK Learn was, of course, built on top of Scikit Learn and, and Python. Um, Auto Weka was built on top of Weka and Java. Uh, there's Teapot, as you mentioned, which is the project that I was working at while I was at University of Pennsylvania, um, which is also built on top of Scikit Learn and, and Python. Um, and then I, I actually recently discovered, well, recently in the past six months or so, uh, there's a very nice package built by a company called H2O. 
and they just simply call it H2O AutoML, and they have a very nice platform that works in a whole bunch of languages, has a nice web interface and everything else, and also free and open source. Uh, and then on the more commercial side, uh, there have been some, some very nice commercial automated machine learning uh, tools out there, primarily uh, Data Robot, which is uh, a really, really interesting tool. It's worthwhile to go and look up a demo. Um, and then there's also H2O driverless AI, which is H2O may sound familiar. Basically, they took their automated machine learning platform and then added some secret sauce in, in it and made it a commercial product as well. And if you were suggesting someone who wanted to get started with AutoML, where would you suggest they go and, and why? Oh, um, I would I would strongly suggest going to one of the I would say one of the open source tools right now. And I mean, I guess it depends on their on their proficiency. If if, if you're familiar with programming and, and data science techniques, and especially if let's say you're familiar with with Scikit Learn, I would strongly recommend going to you know Auto SK Learn, Teapot, one of those tools, and just apply it to either one of the example data sets that either of those projects supply, or more, or even better, apply it to one of the uh, projects in in your in your own work or, or your own hobbies. You know, we, we've designed these tools to be very, very easy to basically take a data set uh, that you're working with and and take a workflow. If let's say you're working in a, in a scikit-learn workflow, it's extremely easy to take auto SK learn or teapot and, and plop it right in there and boom, now you're using automated machine learning. Right. And my understanding is that those two are act as kind of wrappers around scikit learn pipelines, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And for those listeners uh, out there who may not know too much about scikit-learn pipelines, these are ways of combining a bunch of pre-processing steps and then uh, your machine learning algorithm in a really uh, uh, intuitive fashion. The API is v- very nice there. And so Teapot now, I'm, I'm just looking at it on, on, on GitHub. You have 32 contributors, nearly 4,000 stars, nearly 600 forks. This is pretty exciting, right? Wow, is it almost up to four thousand stars? Yeah. <laughs> that is that is very. It has been very exciting to see the, uh, the the community response to this project. You know, I think that's been part of the driving force behind it. You know, because especially lately, now that I'm not getting paid to develop Teapot, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's great to see that that getting feedback from the community in terms of how it's been useful, what are the challenges of the tool. Yeah, it's been the the response for this project has been great. And I think it shows that there really is a strong demand for automated machine learning tools out there. You know, not not just research into it, but actual tools that people can use and integrate into their day to day workflows. That's right. And I suppose my next question is you have a lot of contributors. Do you get much insight into the industries it's used in or the questions people are trying to answer when they use use Teapot, for example? Um, so un- unfortunately, no, you know, people are very, most of the time when people, uh, so I have seen some blogs where, where people write about, you know, Hey, I was, uh, I'm using it for this problem on this open data set. But I think actually a lot of the users of Teapot have been at, at companies, you know, on, on sort of closed source projects. And so usually when I, when I have people reaching out to me about that, they're very, you know, uh, closed lipped about it. And they, they talk to me in very, a very general sense of what kind of problem they're working on. Um, and maybe even provide generated data. Um, but I really wish I, I could get a better sense of the exact problems that people are applying it to. Yeah, I, th- I think so. Do you have um, any thoughts about which industries you see these types of automated machine learning packages ha- being capable of having the most impact? So, yeah, I think industries where there isn't a strong data science presence already will have uh, will, will gain tremendous value from these automated machine learning tools because the basic idea of these tools are to you know allow someone with a minimal amount of experience to take a data set and run a machine learning analysis on it at the level of someone who is fairly proficient at machine learning right so the idea the whole idea behind machine learning is we want to take the brain power of let's say all those people on Kaggle and all the smartest data scientists out there and put it into a single algorithm so if, if someone who's just coming into the field of, of data science, they want to bring machine learning into their field, it's, there's tremendous value there in being able to just basically, you know, pip install a tool. And the next thing you know, you're, you're running a really advanced and really accurate machine learning analysis on your data. I like that a, a great deal. 
in your mind, is there any danger in it then being misused? I mean, you know, this is a general question, actually, as data science tools and their associated APIs become more and more user-friendly, more and more intuitive, is there a challenge in terms of them being misused by people who don't understand the underlying math, for example, and misinterpreting the results? I mean, yeah, I, w- I would say that, that that's always been a concern even before automated machine learning, right? You know, I think that the the authors of, of Scikit-Learn, for example, heard this a lot when people are like, oh, what are you doing? You know, let's, let's keep these machine learning algorithms difficult to use. So only the people who really know them and implement them from scratch can actually use them. And so I, I think this is just a common thing that you hear every time we make something easier and easier to use. So, so yes, there is technically a, a danger there, right? And that someone can build a, a machine learning system that gets really, really high accuracy, but for the, for all the wrong reasons. That's why I think it's important to you know think of tools like this that make machine learning and they, and, and similar powerful tools more accessible. Is you still want to keep an expert in the loop whenever possible um, to help you interpret what, what you're getting, right? You know, so you can get a really good solution from AutoML, but you still need an, an expert there to help you with the actual application and interpretation of, of what you've got, right? And so there, there's still value there, of course, right? Because you didn't have to do, you didn't have to hire a whole team of data scientists or machine learning engineers to implement all of that software and do the whole machine learning analysis for you. But there's still definitely a need to have those experts. Yeah, I like that a lot because that also really highlights the importance of communication and education as well, as opposed to suggesting that or stating that these are skills that are reserved for the few who've been educated at a certain level, um, actually opening it up and saying, hey, you use this, but let's let's keep the communication going going both ways as well and see what we can both learn in that space. Yeah, and I think that's where the science and, and industry, especially science, is going is, is much more collaborative space, right? You know, when I was at the University of Pennsylvania, it was quite common for us to sit down in a meeting where we had a, a genetics research professor there. We had physicians from the hospital there. You know, we had people with statistics background, people with a pure computer science and machine learning background like myself. You know, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's it's in line with that whole idea of, of you know, having a broader collaborative approach. Yeah, cool. And something you've spoken to there is the importance of interdisciplinary research in in, in data science. And I think it's really interesting that you can have a, a bunch of different people in the same room working on different problems, but they're essentially using the same types of techniques. And I think that automated machine learning is that we're going to see more and more people from diverse fields using it. I certainly hope so, yes. So I want to talk about when you mentioned what the main tools are in the current landscape, you mentioned both open source and and, and commercial tools. One thing you mentioned, though, is that uh, you were funded in some sense to work on Teapot when you're at UPenn. Yeah, right. Well, I I wouldn't say I was was necessarily funded funded directly, but I was very generously funded by my PI there, Jason uh, Jason Moore, um, who is funded by, by the NIH to develop uh, machine learning methods and applications that have a biomedical focus. So even though Teapot is a general machine learning tool, we found it tremendously useful in the particular uh, biomedical applications that we were working on. Great. And I know there are lots of questions around viable models for funding open source software development these days. Is this, is this something that you think is, is, is a good way to, to fund such projects? Oh, I mean, I think that's how a, a large portion of uh, open source projects have been funded, at least in you know, the large scale ones, is either through basically public tax funding, right? You know, I was funded by the NAH, but there's plenty of other projects that have come out of NSF funding and, and numerous other agencies in the US and across the world. <laughs> it's not just the US. But, but also, you know, I think that even at commercial companies, there is a huge opportunity there to also fund open source development because, you know, when it comes down to it, a lot of us are working on very, very similar problems. You know, if you, if you take a, a sort of very high level look at the, at the field of data science, you know, when it comes down to, you know, choosing the right machine learning algorithm, tuning hyperparameters, so on and so forth, we're, we're almost always facing the same kind of problem there. So there's no reason that we can't all work together on that and provide a common you know, hopefully better and higher, higher quality solution there in the open source space that will add value not only to the company that's funding it, but also to the data science community in general. That's actually been a major focus of, uh, shall I say, my, my preaching <laughs> at, 
in the life epigenetics team is, is, is pushing, saying, you know, hey, we're not necessarily a machine learning company. You know, we're not going to be selling machine learning as a service. We're applying it. So how about any algorithms that we develop as a part of our work here? Let's make sure to publish them as open source because there's it not, it's, it's actually value both ways. Right. You know, we, we provide value to the open source community, but the open source community provides value back by providing feedback, more code, refinements bug reports and fixes, so on and so forth. That was definitely something we saw. Yeah, and I'm sure as you see more and more well issues, but also probably pull requests even better rolling on in, that's a really exciting experience. Yeah, it's, it's a great way to start the day when I see a good pull request come in on one of my repositories. That's awesome. So we spoke to the fact that there are both open source and commercial tools currently for automated machine learning. What does the future hold with respect to open source tools and commercial nature of such tooling? Well, you know, I think... So, yeah, you know, so like right now, most of what we're seeing is basically the open source automated machine learning tools for the most part are research prototypes that are coming out of research labs, you know, that are pioneering some particular way of doing automated machine learning, whereas the commercial automail tools for the most part are relatively simpler than, than the research prototypes. You know, they're obviously still high quality and scalable and whatnot, but they tend to focus more on, you know, the scalability and especially the user experience, making it easy for a non-expert to use the tool and less so on the advanced optimization techniques or whatever else that you'll typically see in in the open source research prototypes. But I think going forward, um, you know, we're going to see more companies like Google and H2O that I think are run by, by really smart, really good people who invest in both, right? Where you can have a automated machine learning tool out there that is open source and it's something that you develop backed by your company and also supported by the open source community. But then you can also have, let's say, a specialized version of it where you put in, you know, I'll call it the secret sauce that makes it work even better, maybe on a particular problem domain or maybe just in general, right? You know, a better optimization algorithm or whatever else. And that can be your commercial version, right? So um, you can support and have most of the tool out there as open source, but still support a business model that gets companies to buy in. And I think that works really well because when something is free and open source, it's an easy buy-in, right? You just send one of your engineers to try it out. They tinker with it for a day, maybe a week, whatever. And if it works out really well, they become interested. Maybe and maybe they become interested in your commercial product. You know, so I think that that's going to be a great way to get people to buy into AutoML tools. But of course, I'm, thus far, I've been a career academic, not a businessman. So who knows? Maybe I'm just talking on my butt. <laughs> so you you think though that open source tooling and commercial tooling will, will exist kind of uh, in in parallel or one on top of the other in in future. Yeah, I, I mean, that's at least the way I see it. Yeah, well, I mean, the, we'll see. I, I generally try to avoid predicting the future when it comes to tech because most of the time we're wrong. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because I wonder, just with, with thinking about data science tools in general, Python and R are a lot stronger than a lot of their, um, I suppose, proprietary counterparts these days, right? They've been in, the open source software has been really embraced by the data science community. Absolutely. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So we hinted at this before when we discussed what won't be automated. I'm going to ask a provocative question, which I don't necessarily agree with. But my question is, once we automate everything away, what, what will we be doing? <laughs> well, actually, I, I, don't know if, I don't know if we'll... Well, hold on. I guess I should back up and I should ask. Uh, when you say automate everything away, do you mean all the data science work or do you mean everything? Like uh, everything we work on today as human beings. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I mean the, the data science work. The data science work, okay. <laughs> well, you know, I'll be honest. I I, I don't think I, I don't think I've thought down that path quite far enough because I don't actually see us automating all data science away. And, and I sort of alluded to this earlier that you know auto, automated machine learning is more of a data science assistant, and I see it being that way for quite some time. You know, you can think of. Uh, an automated machine learning tool that is acting as like a junior data scientist level. So let's say, yeah, there, there's still going to be a need for that high level guidance of these automated machine learning systems, right? You, it's going to be extremely difficult to automate something like how do we translate this business problem into a data science problem? And so we're still going to need these sort of higher level managers for the automated machine learning systems. Now, I should also point out, by the way, that uh, I've been very excited to see that several companies and groups have started basically throwing their automated machine learning platforms at Kaggle. And 
they've been fairly consistently scoring in, let's say, the top 1% to top 10% or so, but they never quite get in the top two or three of these competitions. And I've been talking to basically everyone I can find that's in auto ML and especially in automated machine learning and Kaggle. And the, the issue that always comes up is that there is always some really smart feature engineering technique that sort of brings you to the next level in terms of solving that problem. And usually it requires some sort of domain expertise or you know, some knowledge of heuristics or whatever else. And you know, it, it, sometimes it can be, even be a simple feature engineering technique, but that's what you needed to take the machine learning algorithm to the next level. And that is extremely difficult to automate. Right? You know, we could sit down and think about thousands of problems and possible custom feature engineering techniques for them. But whenever we enter a new domain, who knows if those will be useful or not, right? So, so I think there's several aspects of data science that will squarely remain in the, in the domain of humans for quite some time, at least until we start getting closer to really higher level uh, artificial general intelligence. Could you give any example of such feature engineering? So, okay, so here's one example of that that I ran into where there was a Kaggle problem where, oh gosh, it was a couple of years ago, so I'm not remembering the exact details, but it was basically your, the features are uh, certain uh, hands in poker, right? You know, so, so you, you get basically each card that you have in your hand and you want to classify what sort of hand this is, right? You know, is this a, is this a straight, is this a pair or whatever else? And the data set gave it a, a very, you know, just very basic inf information, basically. What card is this? What color is it? I think that was it. And then you had to classify it. And so, you know, I threw a teapot at it and it got, it, it actually did pretty poorly. <laughs> I was kind of disappointed. But then some people were scoring, you know, way up there, at like nearly 100%, if I remember right. And the reason behind that was because they had expert knowledge about mm. playing poker, right? So they were, they were able to construct features that weren't necessarily the answer, but they allowed, but they constructed more useful features that the machine learning algorithm could then use to properly classify the hands of the cards, right? So that's a, that I think is a is a nice, really, really basic example of some, of a custom feature engineering technique that requires some domain knowledge and can be tremendously valuable for a classification problem, but is something that would be very, very difficult to automate. Yeah, absolutely. And that I suppose that type of feature engineering would capture interactions between cards in some sense. Exactly. Yeah. And capturing feature interactions is a huge, huge challenge in, in machine learning. We'll jump right back into our interview with Randy after a short segment. We're back with another Principles of Data Science Education segment with Spencer, Datacam's very own curriculum lead. Absolutely right. So today I want to highlight some strategies for learning data science. Data science is as broad or as narrow as you want it to be. And that means that whether you're diving deep into like one specific area, or if you're taking a breadth-first strategy and trying to become a generalist, there's always going to be more to learn. If there's one thing you can be sure of in your career as a data scientist, we can at least guarantee you that you're never going to feel like you've learned it all. If there's so much to keep learning, Spencer, how can someone stay on top of it all? Oh, there's so many different ways. One of the best is just to find an RSS service that you like and start following the work of whatever your favorite data science bloggers are. Everybody's got a blog these days. And once you find that subset of data scientists that are doing work you admire, you can let them show you what needs to be on your radar. Any other things to keep in mind? Yes. So there's a whole body of cognitive psychology literature behind the science of learning. And honestly, it doesn't get talked about enough. We actually know a lot about which study patterns are objectively more effective than others. For example, one big mistake that people make is to chunk their learning into these big one-time events and then move on to something else when they're done. For example, if you're trying to learn Python for data analysis, spending a whole afternoon on a book or an online course in Pandas is a great idea. What's an even better idea, though? Make sure you return to that same material on a regular basis over an extended period of time. This strategy of spaced repetition is going to give you a much better bang for your buck in terms of the amount of time that you spend. So Spencer, how can you make sure you stay engaged with what you're learning? Well, one of the best ways is to dive into something practical. 
So write a blog post, participate in a Kaggle competition, track down a data set that you find interesting and flex your muscle on it. At DataCamp, we have an ever-growing list of projects that can get you working on the skills that you need to learn in either R or Python on real data. This is also one of the big reasons that we're developing DataCamp for mobile. If you're strapped for time, you can leverage downtime like your hours on the train to internalize your data science and programming knowledge over the long run. If you're still learning the basics of R, Python, or SQL for data science, you can practice that material on the mobile app on a regular basis, which is going to improve retention of the content dramatically. If you're especially interested in the science of learning, and you want to make your process for learning data science as data-driven as all of the great things that you can do with that knowledge, I recommend checking out the Learning Scientist blog and podcast at learningscientists.org. We'll put that link in the show notes for you. Go forth and make your data science education just as data-driven as the work that you do with it. Fantastic, Spencer. Look forward to speaking next time. Time to get straight back into our chat with Randy. So one other thing you you, you mentioned was you see uh, AutoML as a data science assistant that may be able to do things that a junior data scientist could 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 do. I'm wondering we there's there's a challenge currently in in the data science landscape which revolves around training junior data scientists and data science career paths. I'm I'm wondering how you see how how would that be affected by having AutoML to do these types of tasks. Well, so okay, so the way I see it is a really good out-of-band machine learning system is going to free you know, not only junior data scientists, but all data scientists from this sort of monotonous, circular process that we often go through in terms of you know, pre-processing, standardizing, uh, and modeling the data. So I think it's going to allow people to really focus more on, on general problem solving, right? You know, that's something I've been hitting on again and again here, which is, you know, I think that more, more important to me than the technical skills of being able to program and, and knowing about machine learning algorithms is really thinking more about what is the problem that we're working on and how do we solve that as a data problem, right? That is such an important skill that I always stress with, you know, all of the students and all the people I work with that unfortunately sometimes goes overlooked in, in some, of, <laughs> some of the machine learning courses out there. And so um, I think that it's going to allow people to focus more on that rather than the nitty gritty of, you know, how does a random forest work or how does an SVM work or, or whatever else. And I think that's actually a really good thing. Yeah. I, I like that a lot because it, it, it really speaks to highlights two things. One is being able to think and actually ask the, the correct questions and also give the, give the correct answers. But also uh, it speaks to um, a translation challenge in terms of we've got a, a a question about a business or about the world in, in academic research or about biology. And we need to translate that into our data science question and our technical question, and then translate it back to, to the real world. And I think those are the types of things where our time would be much, much more well spent. Absolutely. Yes. We've spoken a lot about machine learning and automated machine learning. I'm wondering what one of your favorite data science techniques or methodologies is. Uh, yeah, so I, I think anyone that look, looks into the research papers that I published won't be surprised by this, but um, I would say one of my favorite techniques that I always try to plug wherever I go is evolutionary computation. And it's actually been a very exciting year for evolutionary computation um, because it's, it's sort of like becoming popular again. <laughs> you know, it, it was popular for a while, um, and, but now that people are finding applications for it and deep learning and, and everything, people are becoming interested in it again. Yeah, and I, so the, the, the thing that I really love about evolu evolutionary computation is that it's, it's very easy to understand conceptually, right? Like the basic idea of evolu evolutionary computation is that we want to take this process called evolution that we observe in nature that produced basically all known life on Earth and perhaps even elsewhere, and, and we want to bottle that in the computer and use it as an optimization technique. And so it's, it's really easy to understand conceptually, right? You know, you can go through the, you know, the, let's say, four or five steps of the algorithm and understand it at a high level and know what's going on without having to pour over dozens of pages of math, 
which is especially important for me because I'm not a super mathy person. And I think it's also great because it has a very flexible solution represent, representation. So basically, whenever you're using an evolutionary algorithm, you, you say, hey, this is what I want my solution to look like. And evolution algorithms can work with basically any kind of solution. You're not stuck with artificial neural networks. You're not stuck with a machine learning model or a graph or whatever else. You can use basically whatever you want. And that means that you can apply it to almost any kind of problem out there, um, which is what I've tried to show somewhat on my blog. And then also the, the uh, third great, great part about it is that it has this concept of a fitness function, which basically allows you to tell the algorithm exactly what you want out of a solution. So, you know, in, in machine learning, typically we have to use some sort of fixed loss function or, or accuracy or whatever else. With the, with the evolution algorithm, you can say, you know, I want my solution to only cost me $5 or, or, or whatever else, right? You know, um, you, you can specify that kind of criteria directly in the optimization process itself. Uh, and, and also, uh, not, not to gush too much about evolutionary algorithms, this but right. I think another great, <laughs> yeah, I think another great part about it is that because evolutionary algorithms consider multiple solutions to a problem simultaneously, um, you can actually use this this idea called Pareto optimization to basically look at a trade off between multiple things that you want from it, right? So, to give some very uh, explicit examples, let's say in machine learning. Typically, we're making some trade-offs between, let's say, the complexity of our algorithm or the interpretability of our algorithm and the predictive performance of that algorithm, right? Well, in, in a Pareto front sense, you can, can you can think of that as but basically a curve in solution space where you can you can look at this trade-off between how complex is my model and how accurate is my model, and that and that's especially nice because it lets you decide. On what that on, on what trade off you want as an end user, right? You know, if if you want simply the most predictive algorithm out there and you don't care about complexity, then choose that one. If you're working in, in a space where you need a, a really interpretable model, well, then maybe you're willing to sacrifice a little bit of accuracy for that. Um, and I think that's a really really great bonus that you get just because of how evolutionary algorithms are designed. Absolutely. And that actually, that also, once again, highlights the type of things that data scientists spend their best time doing, right? Thinking about these types of questions while we're automating away the other stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Great. So if somebody wanted to get started with evolutionary computation in Python, for, for example, where, where, where could they do that? Uh, well, well, there's a there's a number of libraries out there. Um, the one that I usually you actually use myself and uh, and recommend to people is called Deep. It's D E A P. Um, usually, if you type like D E A P Python into Google, it'll pull up that that package. Um, and they have you know that they, they've basically written up all kinds of different evolutionary algorithms out there that are out there. Um, and have some really easy to use examples and interfaces that make it really easy to jump in and start using evolution and computation in just, you know, like 10 minutes or so. Cool. And I, and I think that's especially great. You know, I, I always try to encourage people, especially when they're coming into the field, to use a pre-existing package <laughs> um, because, you know, like, like I said, the greatest part about evolution and computation is it's really easy to understand and it's actually really easy to implement. And because of that, we probably, there are probably thousands of implementations of evolutionary algorithms out there because everyone you know, says, oh, I can do this better. I'm going to implement my own. Um, but I think the, the deep developers have done a very, very good job of, of covering you know, most of the bases that you'll need uh, when, you're, when you're applying evolutionary computation to a problem. Good. And we'll link to deep in, in the show notes also. Awesome. So my final question is, do you have a, a final call to action for, for our listeners out there? Uh, yeah. So, uh, can I have three? Yes, of course you can. All right. <laughs> I, I feel, I feel like, you know, I, I, I rubbed a bottle and a, and a genie came out and I said, can I have more wishes? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, th these are all related. So, so at least there's, there's that. Um, okay. So my first one I'm going to say is in machine learning, stop using only your favorite machine learning algorithm. It doesn't matter what that is, you know, whether it's, Deep, you know, a, a, a deep neural network, whether it's a random forest, whether it's XGBoost, whatever else, stop only using that algorithm when you approach a machine learning problem. You know, we all know that there is no such thing as a one best machine learning algorithm for all problems. So 
why do we ignore that? Especially, you know, when we become experts at this, why do we ignore that advice and focus in on just our favorite algorithms? We, you know, so, uh, and I should point out, by the way, that this is the most common source of value gained from automated machine learning platforms is that like, Data scientists come in and they have, or, or even machine learning engineers come in and they have their handful, you know, maybe two or three favorite machine learning algorithms. And they get vastly outperformed by an automated machine learning system who is considering perhaps dozens of machine learning algorithms. Um, and so that's, that's what, that's, I've actually seen many companies write and talk about this where they say that was an immediate source of value from automated machine learning. It sort of broadened our horizons in terms of what we're considering in the machine learning space. The second call to action that I'll, that I'll have is to stop using default parameters for machine learning algorithms. You know, this, this one sounds almost obvious to anyone who's used machine learning before, but it's provable that in scikit-learn, for example, that, that the default parameters are almost always bad for most problems. We, we actually did a research paper on this just the last year and, pr- and proved that. So there there is always a good way to tune the parameters of your algorithm and, and gain five to 10% accuracy uh, or, you know, predictive, uh, predictive performance, whatever metric you're using. <laughs> That's really interesting. And actually, I think I recall you tweeting out one of the key figures from, from that paper l- last year. Yeah, exactly. Actually, that, that might be a, a good thing to, uh, to link to as well. You know, we have several, several visualizations in there showing the results of that really hu- a huge experiment it took Way, way too much computation time to do, but you know, basically showing that there's always value from doing model selection and there's always value from tuning the default parameters. Um, and, and, and related there, stop using grid search for tuning parameters. That's such an antiquated thing now. You know, we, have, we have random search, we have better optimization, parameter optimization methods like based on Bayesian optimization and other techniques. There's no reason to use grid search anymore, basically. Uh, there's always better methods for that. And then my third call to action, which which might not be unexpected here, which is uh, to start using automated machine learning tools, whether it's at work or in your personal hobby projects or in Kaggle. Um, you know, automated machine learning will definitely give you a competitive advantage now while it's new. You know, a, a handful of people are using it, and and it's it's incredibly easy to integrate into your workflow, and it's going to make you look like a much more productive person. Trust me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I know some people who who have used Teapot, for example, to solve a problem, and Teapot actually has the ability to export. The corresponding second learn code, and, and they basically said like, "Yeah, that was me." You know, <laughs> give me give me a raise now. Give me a raise now, thanks. <laughs> so yeah, and if you do start using these automated machine learning tools, especially Teapot, let you know. Let me know. I'm, I'm curious to learn about where people are applying it, how well it's doing, what are the challenges that it's facing. You know, I think having that kind of information and sharing it with the community is going to be tremendously valuable. So also, you know, definitely drop my email. In there so people can easily get in touch with yeah them. i will I'll, I'll do so and also let us awesome. know at, at, at data camp at data framed and it's a running theme on on, on this show on, on this podcast to encourage listeners to to blog and put jupyter notebooks or markdown files up, up there as you know randy is 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 great testament to so if you start using these tools write write a short blog either on your own blog or you can write on our, our data camp community about it because that would be be a lot of fun i think Absolutely. That's actually one, another one of the top things that I always recommend to students working with me is to start a blog, start putting this code out there, start getting feedback from the community and, and learn how to take that feedback, right? You know, sometimes people are not so nice, but maybe there's a, an ounce of truth in what they're saying. Um, so yeah, I think it's such a great way to interact with the open source community and the data science community. In general. Yeah, absolutely. Randy, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thanks again for having me. I had a blast. Thanks for joining our conversation with Randy about automated machine learning. We saw how AutoML, as part of automated data science assistance work, will increasingly take much of the drudgery out of data scientists' work, from pre-processing to model selection and hyperparameter tuning, freeing up data scientists to work more on using their skills to pose and answer the interesting and important questions in their research discipline or line of work whether it be insurance pricing, medicine, or astronomy. One of my favorite takeaways of this episode were Randy's three calls to action. One, branch out in terms of the machine learning models you use. Two, do not use the antiquated technique of grid search anymore. And three, start playing around with automated ML technologies such as Teapot. I know that I will. 
Make sure to check out our next episode, a conversation with Anthony Goldblum, CEO of Kaggle. If you thought that Kaggle was merely a platform for machine learning competitions, prepare to have your mind blown, as ML comps account for less than a third of the activity on Kaggle today. Anthony and I will discuss Kaggle kernels for reproducible data science and the evolution of the Kaggle public data platform. To do so, we'll make detours through the genesis of Kaggle and how Anthony managed to solve the cold start problem of building a two-sided marketplace. We'll discuss the exciting implications of Kaggle's recent acquisition by Google for the future of cloud-based data science, and we'll hear why Python is dominating on Kaggle. I'm your host, Hugo Bound Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Hugo Bound and Datacamp at Datacamp. You can find all our episodes and show notes at datacamp.com slash community slash podcast.